It, I, I think it's limitless. I've seen it for myself in 96. I was also, you know, part of the Olympics in 2012 and saw the uplift at, at varying matches or at varying when I went to watch Olymp um, athletics at the, the Olympic Park. The uplift in the population was quite incredible. It really was. Hello and welcome to the UCFB LMA Insight Series, where we speak to some of the most important and influential names in the world of football. My name's Holly and today I'm joined by Stuart Pearce, an England legend who gained 78 caps for his country, played for the likes of Nottingham Forest in Manchester City and went on to manage these clubs along with the England Under-21 team. Thanks very much for joining us, Stuart. My pleasure. Good to be aboard. So going right back to the start of your career, why were you initially reluctant to leave non-league football and play in the top flight? Um, well, I wouldn't say I was reluctant to leave and go into the, the top flight. Probably the first opportunity I had was a 17-year-old and uh, whole city invited myself and, and the club captain at my non-league club up to Hull for a, a couple of days trial and a reserve game. And at the end of that, they offered... I was offered uh, a contract at Hull, who were in the bottom division at the time. And also, he said uh, he could possibly get me a job on Humberside Borough Council to carry on my apprenticeship as an electrician. So, at the time, it was a, an interesting offer, but it seemed a long way from home at the age of 17. So, that was my first opportunity that I personally turned down. And then, when I had an opportunity of... Um, at the age of 21 to join Coventry City in, in the top division. It wasn't something I, I sort of thought about for too long. It was a great opportunity for me. Um, but it was uh, a reduction in wages, bizarrely, you know. So from, I think I was earning £280 a week as, a, as an electrician um, and uh, a part-time footballer in, in the division just outside the, the football league. I was offered a £30 wage cut to, to be a the equivalent of a Premier League footballer nowadays, which seems quite strange looking back. So I didn't have to think about it too long, but certainly I turned one opportunity down um, at the age of 17 because I felt as I was a little bit too young at the time to take that opportunity. Yeah, makes sense. So what was the best part of working under Brian Clough at Nottingham Forest? Uh, well, um I mean, for me, I joined him as at the age of 23 and stayed with him uh, until I was 31. So my most informative years uh, as probably as a man and growing up, let alone as an education, as a footballer. Um, I just think every day was different with him. He, he kept the game very simple. Um, it was an opportunity to join not just a, a, a progression in my career, joining Nottingham Forest, but... I, th I think Brian Clough's influence in the game, he was an individual that I used to watch when I was a kid on, on television, watching him be a pundit, and you sort of hung on his every word. He was a real character within the game, and the opportunity to join him was probably greater than joining Nottingham Forest in many ways. Um, uh, and just literally every day was an education. He wanted the game played in the right and proper manner. Um, and... You know, he was probably one of the first, I would say, psychologists in football in many ways. You know, he knew how to treat players, I think. Sometimes he delivered harsh messages. Sometimes he was very kind, you know. So it was a real mixed bag that you got from him. But no two days were the same, I can assure you. I can imagine. Hmm. So after 11 years as a player at Nottingham Forest, how did becoming player-manager at the club change your perspective of the game? Um. It was an interesting one. Probably I was, you know, because I was, I've was been at the club for sort of over a decade and all the players in the dressing room and I was a big part of what went on in the dressing room as, as the club captain and leader and whatever. Um, and a lot of the people in that dressing room were my friends and we used to socialise together away from, from the club as well. The difficult part of it was probably not so much from my point of view, more so from the other players on how to take me now because... One day I walked in, I was a teammate. The next day I was picking the team. And that straight away changes the dynamics of, of the interaction between yourself and the rest of the players. 
one of the first decisions I had to make was we all used to change in the same dressing room together. So I, I thought to myself, is it right and proper for me still now as a manager or certainly as an acting manager to change with the players or not? Would they need their space from someone who's acting as a player? And I decided to sort of uh, still stay in the dressing room and my role wouldn't change. But it was interesting to see that the same people that included me in the, in the banter of the dressing room, when I walked in the following day as being named the, the new acting manager, caretaker manager, those players would clam up and, and be very quiet when I walked in the door, you know. So the dynamic changed a little bit, let's say, you know. And whenever you, you've you got to pick a team, you're always going to alienate potentially those players outside the team. So that was the sort of first my noticeable first part of of being a manager and what that actually meant and your relationship between yourself and the rest of the squad and where you had to draw sort of barriers if you like you know and all of a sudden my social life stopped a little bit outside football because i didn't think it was right and proper you know to be going out with the players uh in the evening potentially as well so it was a strange one but at the age I was at, I think I was maybe 34 years old at the time. So I was probably um, pretty close to being used to, um, closer to the management side of, of things maybe than the, the playing side. Yeah. So how do you think the emergence of the Premier League changed football from a player's perspective? Um, I, I always felt as though the Premier League was comes near enough hand in hand, almost a, it was a year or so out of difference, but with probably Italy 90, the World Cup in Italy in 90, I think the game got a great deal more exposure around the country, if you like. People that were probably not actual football fans got hooked a little bit. And that for me was almost the exposure, uh, found a new audience in many ways, football did. And on the back of that, a year or so later, come the Premier League. And I think, I just think the exposure just grew and grew. Um, you know, from my point of view, that tallied in with new stadiums being built, professionalism of the club, more foreign players coming to these shores because more money was readily available. With that, the professionalism of the game was more enhanced. And I, I think everything seemed to come at the same sort of time and it was that early 90s period you know and uh, everything come and, and for me for the greater good in many ways i think there were so many good things come with that um you know potentially not not so many downturns but from a player's point of view it was a wonderful time to be a player sure so given your combative style of play do you think you'd have to adapt your game now or keep it the same? I, I, I think all players have to, to adapt, you know, I had to adapt to the times I was playing in and sometimes you adapt to to what's gone on in the game and what's happened in the game, you know. Um, I always, I'm always keen to point out, whilst I had a sort of quite a robust reputation as a player and probably ended up playing over my career as a non-league player and as a professional, I played somewhere in the region of a thousand matches and was only ever sent off five times. So. I, I always point out the fact of if you've been sent off once every 200 matches, it's not a bad disciplinary record. But I always felt as though I I took the laws of the game to the line and rarely went over that line that would put me in jeopardy of being sent off in matches, you know. And I, I think this day and age in games, even players nowadays have to adapt in regard to the, the rules, the laws of the game. And... When I'm coaching now, when you see players, there are no challenges in the penalty box anymore. Players are so aware that uh, other players are going to go down cheaply or the slightest touch is going to result on a penalty. You have to adapt. The clever players adapt quickly. I always felt as though I was cute enough in my time. And even if I played nowadays, you would have to adapt the way you play to sort the current climate of the game. Yeah, makes sense. So, can you tell us about what David Moyes has instilled in the West Ham squad this season that's led to one of their best seasons in Premier League history? Um, I, I think he's instilled a work ethic within the group um, 
there's a real togetherness. There's, there's a demand on all the players that you have to work hard for the team. That we, we can't afford any passengers in the team, if you like. Um, and, and people have picked that up and run with it really well. He, he's, um, I mean, for me, he, he's a great education for me as a coach now to work alongside him. His work ethic's unbelievable. He drives the, the team on. And, and the staff on around him with his work rate, you know, he's in at eight in the morning and he, he won't leave before seven at night. And that that isn't just sat around doing very little, you know, this is analysis of players looking at the opposition. I've never in my whole time as a, involved in football, I've never analysed the opposition uh, and their performance and how they are going to line up against us and talk tactics as much as I have with David in, in the time I've worked with him. So he's a real education. And I think if you lead by example, like he does, it, it's infectious to the rest of the players. You know, he's he, he'll tell players if he needs more from them, he'll make demands of them. And the good thing is the group have taken that on board as well and that they're very self-critical in regard to, to wanting to get better and the togetherness we've got. And couple that with the fact we, we've made a couple of cute signings that have been very helpful to us over time. Cool. So how has the role and influence of managers changed in the modern game? Well, I... <laughs> I think the demands on the modern day manager is just ridiculous now. It's, it's it's off of any scale as it used to be. When you consider you've got media to deal with, you've got internal staff to deal with, you've got the players to deal with, and the number of players has grown drastically at football clubs. Um, everyone's got an opinion of the game. You know, I work for TalkSport Radio as well. And, and to be fair, everyone on TalkSport's got an opinion of how Jose Mourinho can do it better and how various other managers can do it better, which is quite incredible, really, when you consider the CVs of some of the managers, you know. So you're permanently under scrutiny as a manager. Uh, you're only one game away from complete disaster and the sack, potentially. So... The demands of a modern day manager are quite incredible and, and you probably wouldn't believe some of the stuff that managers have to deal with what are not on occasion football related even you know and throw into the mix as we stand at the moment the pandemic and and you know the testing that the players have to do how you have to we can't bring young players in without into our bubble without being tested at the moment if they go out to play we got another 23s game later on if they go out to play in that, they've got to be tested before they come back in. It's all those things thrown in the mix are dealt with by the manager in one way, shape or form. And I've, I've not even touched on managers dealing with owners and the ownership of football clubs this day and age, you know. So it really is a very difficult job, football management. And a lot more is in consideration, let's say, than probably a lot of people on the outside of the game actually believe it is. Yeah, I can see that. Mm. So, um, can you tell us about Euro 96 and what it was like playing at a major tournament in your own country? Um, well, it, it was sensational for me. I, I went into Euro 96 um, having made a decision that it was going to be my retirement from England afterwards. As it goes, um, in hindsight, I was talked out of retirement after the tournament come back. But... Going into the tournament, I, I'd made my mind up. I think I was 34 at the time, decided to retire from international football. So I knew this was a big one for me. It might be the last time I ever wear an England shirt for my country. Um, I had been a bit part player leading into the tournament for about a year and a half. Uh, Graham Lasso took my place. So I was um, someone that I got the odd game now and then, or I was in the stand watching the game or on the substitutes bench, but not a regular up until I think it was probably the April before the tournament started that summer when uh, Graham got a, a broken ankle and I got my opportunity to start the tournament. So I was very fortunate that I was uh, diligent enough to hang around, even though I was sort of on the periphery of it. Um, but the tournament itself was like nothing I've ever experienced. You know, I, you know, the atmosphere at Wembley, the opportunity to play on. And bear in mind, it was the first major tournament that, that was played on our shores since the World Cup in '66. 
Um, I think people probably of your generation know what, what the country was like when the Olympic Games was here in 2012 and the uplift that gave the country. Euro 96 done exactly the same, you know, albeit it was, what, 25 years ago now. So it, it was just a wonderful sort of environment to play your football. On top of that, my opportunity to sort of end my career on a tournament in in England. I've got a real connection with the borough of Brent where Wembley is. I, that's where I trained as an electrician. I lived there for a number of years. I've worked at the stadium as a young kid. I've been a ball boy at the FA Vars final. I've got a real connection with the stadium and the borough. Um, and it was just, it was such a special occasion and the togetherness and the camaraderie amongst the squad was fantastic as well. That sounds great. And quite soon after, like you said, Italy and <coughs> so like the whole, you know, um, spirit of the nation type thing. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Like, you know, I, I think about the, the tournament that's coming up this summer and how fortunate the players are to be on home soil taking part in a major tournament and the opportunity they've got of giving our country, especially after the tough year uh, we've had with a pandemic, I think they've got a great opportunity to, to give everybody a real lift, you know, if this tournament goes well for us. Yeah, definitely. So do you think the media and fans have to be careful not to place too much pressure on, on England at the Euros? The media and fans can't help but place <laughs> a load of pressure on England, sadly. I think the one thing... I, I see a real different change now and a different feel, feeling around the England squad than when I played in it. I, I always felt as though there was angst between the media and the squad. And um, I don't know, it, it just seemed a little bit different. Whilst I would say there's more exposure now, if you like, and, and more access to, to the England squad nowadays, I, I think there's a better feeling about the, the connection between the supporters, the media, uh, and the England squad, I think there's a real support of the team. I really do. And I think Gareth Southgate's played a really big part in that. You know, I know before Russia, I as part of the media set up with TalkSport, who's going to cover the tournament. Uh, they had an open day at St George's Park when they laid all the players out. They give access to all the players, to all the media, which was fantastic. And it really sort of I don't know, it just drew the media and, and the squad and England together. And I think it was a masterstroke by by the, the powers that be at the FA and long overdue. So I think that was good. And, and since then, I, I, you know, I sit with the media on England games. I've covered England for the last three tournaments, I think, you know. And you, you get the impression that people that are sat alongside me in the stand that are covering it for varying media outlets are very supportive of England and desperate to do well. Yeah. So what do you think this England side need to do differently to pass teams to win the tournament? Um, they, they've got to cope with pre-tournament nerves and tournament nerves, you know, in, in probably the two tournaments, two, I, I've been to three major tournaments, certainly... Two of those we started, I would say three of them potentially, started not particularly well. And I think a lot of that went down to pre-tournament nerves. You've got to cope with that. We've got to defend extremely well. I think we've probably got to have maybe six or seven of our key players to be on top form um, come the tournament. And then you've got to have that that player that comes from nowhere, potentially, that you didn't think was going to be a key star to the team. We had Gascoigne and probably Des Walker in 1990. Um, Gascoigne, in, in a different way, come to the fore, but uh, a few years later in 96. So you, you've really got to have a few players that really hit form at the right time. And probably looking at this squad as well, we've got to defend well and, and probably... The attacking side of our game, I, I think, is good enough to win the tournament. Are we going to be good enough defensively, consistently enough to win the tournament? That will be my my question. Cool. So we've already touched on this, but what do you think the tournament can bring to the spirit of the nation after a difficult year? It, I, I, I think it's limitless. I've seen it for myself in 96. I was also, you know, part of the Olympics in 2012 and saw the uplift at, at varying matches or at varying when I went to watch Olymp um, athletics at the, the Olympic Park. 
the uplift in the population was quite incredible. It really was. And I think this tournament's got the opportunity to certainly do that. You know, I hope it's a successful tournament for all considered for not just England, but the other home nations as well with Scotland and uh, Wales. So uh, it really has got the opportunity to sort of showcase, you know, Britain and the varying, you know, the semi-finals are on these shores, the finals here, the group games, few other group games are here that are England involved in. So we've got a wonderful opportunity and I think we will. I think we'll deliver a fantastic tournament. The infrastructure is brilliant. The stadiums are fantastic and we've got the, a great opportunity to showcase that once again that, that these shores can deliver a major to worldwide tournament and, and deliver it successfully. Yeah, definitely. So finally, for those looking to break into the sports industry in various roles from coaching to media to finance, mm. what's your one piece of advice for them to take into their career? If I had to put it down to one piece of advice, I would say you're going to be up against a lot of rivals that have probably got a similar, you know, degree, piece of paper, qualification, whatever it may be. And that's vital that you get that. That's something that I did sort of when I finished as a player, I made sure that I went on every possible course I could to, to make sure I was as qualified as anybody. That's a starting point only for me. That's a bare minimum because unless that qualification arrives on someone's desk and you've got it, you won't get an interview. Now, this is the key point. You've got to deliver personality when you go into any role, any job, anywhere. You've got to make sure that your personality stands out. You're prepared to go that extra mile work-wise and, and really catch an employee's eye. And once you get the job, make sure that you catch their eye on a daily basis and you give to that organisation. That is key to me. I, I bump into a lot of people in and around everywhere that I've worked. And the key ones, we, we've got two itinerants working here at West Ham at the moment that have worked here all year. And I've got to say, they are sensational. Great personalities around the place. They know exactly where to pitch themselves in this environment. They're in at six o'clock in the morning and they leave after we leave in the evening. And they're just fantastic. And it's the personality skills that they bring to the organisation as well as the work ethic. And that's that's what you've got to do. You've got to bear in mind that there's there's a work environment out there and applications for jobs are very vast. You know, there's going to be a multitude of people coming to, to get the same job and keep the same job and progress in the same job. So what is your unique selling point? Quite often, it's your personality. Cool. Thank you very much. No problem.